I'm been slightly disappointed that you ask about being dragged towards this. Um, I'm slightly disappointed to the attitude of uh, some people within the Celtic camp. Now, can I say very early on, former Celtic supporter for 30 odd years, brought up in the East End of Glasgow from the Irish Catholic diaspora, there is no reason why I should have a bias or a bigotry against Celtic in any way at all. In fact, I, I can, if I could give you a small story, uh, I supported Celtic for the most of my life, but found myself standing on a about and sitting on a it was not standing on a terrace, and it was sitting on a stand one day uh, with my son, who started to take an interest in football and hearing the song, Who Are Up The Ra. And I couldn't accept that I could bring my son up alongside this. So I was driven away from the club that I loved, and I was very disappointed with that. I had hoped that a period of time, you asked earlier on, someone asked, I can't remember who in the committee asked, about uh, what other organisations <coughs> have been brought into the clubs to talk to. Now, No By Mouth was one, and uh, the other one was Boys Against Bigotry, which was uh, started within Celtic Football Club, which I was very absolutely delighted with at the time, and think it was needed at the time. I'm not convinced that it's been followed through for a period of time now. And over the last few years, uh, the un unacceptance of any problems uh, has disappointed me uh, within Celtic because uh, uh, someone once said to me they had to hide their moral high ground and they've now lost it. Uh, and I, th I thought it was an interesting argument, not one that I put myself, but I, an interesting argument. So I come from a position now where I actually have felt slightly intimidated. Uh, it had <laughs> the opposite effect on me. Uh, certainly, some, certain people within Celtic or the Celtic family, certainly a number of supporters, emailed the BBC asking me to be sacked from my job because during the Cup final I suggested that uh, I was uh, disappointed with the sectarian singing. Now, this became a semantic debate over what sectarian means. But uh, if I remember the phrase was, I, as a young man, I want to join, join the IRA, I'm going to join the IRA, brackets, provisional wing, offended me and I didn't want to see that at a football ground. So. Um, there was complaints from Celtic Football Club to the BBC and from a great number of the fans. I was shocked and surprised by this because what I expected to hear was we don't want to hear these sort of songs at our ground. It's a football ground, it shouldn't be a political ground. And that's why. Dr. Wheaton, I suspect you have a different view. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think there's so much confusion wrapped up in this debate. I'd, I'd really like you know, the last two speakers to spell out what it is they're talking about because one of the issues that needs to be nailed down, I think, is what we mean by sectarianism. So, and why is it just football? Because for me, the fact that uh, when we discuss sectarianism, it is almost always to do with football suggests that uh, if you wanted to look at sociologically, uh, or in terms of a dynamic in society, basically means sectarianism doesn't exist. Right? So if you talked about racism historically, and the only place you could find examples of racism were at a football ground, you would say that that was a strange social phenomenon. Because you didn't just find it at a football ground, you'd find Pakistanis being beaten up uh, constantly, you'd have issues of immigration, deportation, police harassment, so on and so forth. If, if sexism only existed at football grounds, you would think it was not a, you know, why would it only exist at football grounds or are connected to football? Surely it's related to the home, to uh, discrimination in the workplace, so on and so forth. And yet, whenever we have the discussion about sectarianism, we talk about Celtic and Rangers. That's it. That's what we talk about. It's because sectarianism at, at any social or sociological level doesn't exist. So what we're talking about is etiquette. Right? Graham Spears wants fans to be polite because he's offended by words that are chanted by Rangers fans. Pat similarly seems to want the correct etiquette. Shouting an IRA song arguably is a political thing, whether you could say that that's sectarian at all uh, is debatable. So we have a form of West End dinner party etiquette being demanded at football no, this is, but this is genuinely what's happening. I mean, this is a snob's law, potentially. We're targeting specifically football fans, not comedians, not anybody else, football fans, particularly rowdy football fans, i.e. rough working class blokes and lads who shout and sing songs for 90 minutes and then go home 
to their Catholic wife, Protestant grandparents, so on and so forth. Uh, and the, to, to, to think that this is anything to do with a genuine social problem of sectarianism, the shame of Scotland, is farcical. And I genuinely believe if the media and the politicians and the police didn't make such a big deal about this problem, sectarianism, we wouldn't be discussing it anymore because all we'd be talking about is Celtic and Rangers football fans who hate each other in a tribal rivalry that exists in football. And we should recognise that that's what football is about. The point about being a football fan a lot of the time is to be offensive. That's why this bill is so problematic because that is what you do at football. You offend the opposition, the players, and so on. You might not like that, but that's how football operates. And you know, for the vast majority of football fans, as far as I can tell, uh, this is part of the excitement and love of football is the rivalry and tribalry, tribalry that exists within it.